Good evening. Uh, I'm going to be fairly brief. My name is Brian Stankus. Uh, I'm a professional engineer in the state of New Jersey, and I represent the firm of WSP in uh, Lawrenceville, New Jersey. Uh, as, um, as Council President mentioned, I am uh, WSP is the city's consultant. Um, I've been a traffic engineer for uh, just under 28 years, uh, having performed, uh, can't count how many uh, traffic studies, uh, traffic impact studies like the, like the study that Mr. Seckler has prepared. Uh, in addition, I've reviewed a number of traffic studies uh, on behalf of municipal and county land use boards in the state. Uh, I, as I said, I'm a registered professional engineer in New Jersey and also a professional traffic operations engineer. So WSP was retained by the City of Summit to, uh, to sort of serve as the role of the independent uh, third-party reviewer, uh, traffic engineering reviewer of the, uh, of the traffic engineering materials prepared uh, by Mr. Seckler and Stonefield for the Broad Street West Redevelopment uh, Subdistrict 3. So since last August, we've been reviewing uh, the data and the calculations and the reports uh, that, uh, that Stonefield has generated, uh, providing comments and, and guidance along the way, and then coordination with, uh, with uh, Mr. Schrager and, uh, and uh, Topology, the, uh, the planning consultant for the redeveloper, and coordination again with, with Mr. Seckler and his firm. And so we've gotten to the point where we've reviewed um, all of the all of the reports that they've prepared, we've reviewed. You know, we understand the materials that are going to be presented this evening. Uh, and we've also had some coordination in a recent meeting with Union County. Um, so again, I just wanted to confirm that um, you know the materials that Mr. Seckler is about to present. Uh, you know, we've reviewed, um, and in large part, you know, we're, we're we we uh, we concur with their conclusions and their recommendations and the improvement program that uh, that's about to be presented. Thank you. Um, do you want to? I don't know if people will have questions. Maybe we'll hold all the questions for both of you till till after the presentation. Does that, that make be, sense? I think that would be best. Okay. Yes. Great. Thank you. Uh, may I? Yes, you can sit at the table right there. That way you can jump in. You have a microphone that works if you need to jump in. Okay. Welcome, Mr. Seckler. Good evening. Thank you, Council President. Uh, as you mentioned, and Brian mentioned, I am a principal at Stonefield Engineering Design. Uh, we are an engineering firm. Uh, I have worked in the traffic engineering industry for over 15 years. Uh, been, uh, our, we have offices in Rutherford, New Jersey, Princeton, New Jersey, and four other locations outside of the state. Um, our bread and butter is traffic studies like what we have presented for this project. We prepare anywhere between 150 and 200 traffic studies like this, although there were some specifics that I'll get into during my presentation that were required of us as part of the redevelopment plan. And I think that honestly goes to, uh, you know, I assume the council's input as well as the planning uh, group's input in making sure that this was a very comprehensive traffic study. And I'll get through in terms of what we typically do in our industry, plus I think some of the uh, added uh, analysis we provided uh, to uh, come up with this, uh, our analysis and our conclusions. Um, again, this is just the opening slide, the Broad Street West Redevelopment Project. Um, our overall traffic study was 600 pages long. I'm trying to boil it down into a very simple presentation. Obviously, if there are questions that are getting to the specifics, I have those answers, but I don't want to go over 600 pages of traffic information. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> exactly. And the fact you have two traffic engineers here speaking at once is already a lot of traffic. Um, overall, uh, again, what we had studied here, and I'll go through some graphics as well, we did a traffic impact study that consisted of 18 intersections. We studied five time periods that included the weekday morning rush hour, the school arrival rush hour, the school dismissal rush hour, because again, you have middle school plus a lot of other daycare type facilities in the area, an evening rush hour, as well as a Saturday kind of shopping peak, typically between 11 a.m. and 2 p.m. So what we end up studying was a very extensive time period trying to capture all the possible busiest typical days in basically downtown Summit. Our counts, and again, this project for us started in 2021, so unfortunately we've always done counts or been a part of this project during the pandemic. So we did is the counts that we counted, which was in September of 2021, we adjusted them to pre-pandemic levels. In order to do so, what we did is we counted areas that the DOT specifically had 
data for from back in 2018. So we were able to see at these couple of data points in Summit how much lower was traffic when we did our counts in 2021 and then adjusted that traffic upwards to get to a pre-pandemic level. Um, I, I do think in a lot of downtowns, especially areas of train stations, I don't think we've gotten back to that you know, pre-pandemic level. People aren't commuting by train, so they're not coming through the area. So again, we relied on that 2018 kind of data set and then took our counts and grew them up to those values. In addition, as part of this analysis, we looked not only as at the traffic volumes on the road, but also accident history. It was required as part of our study, as part of the redevelopment plan, uh, that we would to look at the accident data at all of these study intersections to come up with suggested mitigations or improvements. Not every suggestion may be relevant to this specific subdistrict. Some of it may be useful for future grant writing by the city, but overall what we, our goal was to basically look at every intersection, see it from a multimodal standpoint and suggest potential improvements. We also did a parking review. Uh, this included parking analysis in terms of what our overall demand is. I know Tim Haas, another consultant, had done basically a citywide parking study as well. We consulted that, but our parking review was specifically really uh, in tune towards the demands of this development, not necessarily the city at large. Um, as part of this, this study and the counts that we performed, uh, again, at those 18 intersections, we did not just focus on motor vehicles. The fact that this is a downtown that has a mix of uses, it has a strong pedestrian and bicycle kind of infrastructure and demand, that when we did our counts, we counted all forms of transportation. In addition, when we did our analysis, we included the future volumes, and we'll get to it later, from both vehicles, bicycles, and pedestrians. So where we think people will be walking to the train, we didn't just pretend that they wouldn't actually be having to press the button and walk across the street or walk across some unsignalized stop sign intersections. We accounted for that in our overall analysis. And again, I think when you're dealing with an overall kind of a downtown, the point is the car shouldn't necessarily overrule the rest of things. If you have a downtown that is you know, car-centric or cars are flying through, you basically do not have a downtown that it really has, uh, I would say, substance or reason for people to stop and, and enjoy. And I know that's obviously some of its intention is to you know, continue their successful downtown. So overall study area, and again, I'll get a little more zoomed in, but the subdistrict three, for those that aren't aware, is generally the area outlined in red. Uh, to the northwest would be uh, Broad Street. Along the bottom of the page, um, kind of running from left to right, would be, would be uh, Morris. And on the right-hand side of that red triangle will be Cedar. And I'll be zooming in so you see, again, this is the, I'd say, very specific uh, you know, area around the project. But what we studied was all of these uh, intersections that are outlined in pink on this plan. So again, while our triangle of, of the development of Subdistrict 3 is generally was in that, that red triangle, we studied as far out of those 18 intersections that are outlined in, in pink. So again, this was not an area that we really just zoomed in on. We looked at it from a holistic standpoint. The reason why I mentioned this is if we were doing a traffic study, I would say in most general municipalities, again, I do hundreds of them a year, for this size development, I typically would just be counting, see if I can go backwards, the intersections that are in that triangle. Your redevelopment plan, and again, obviously, with uh, you know, uh, input from the planning department, the uh, redevelopment planners and council, required this level of traffic study. So again, I think that this is a project that you know, I, I would say uh, is definitely seeing its, its due diligence as part of this overall project. Um, again, this is the zoom in kind of of the subdistrict three area. You'll see on the next slide the proposed development. I think this council and the public has seen other um, presentations about the architecture, the uses in the building. I'm not going to get deep into it. It's a little outside of my uh, specialty. But again, what we're looking at uh, here is the proposed development program. And again, from top right to bottom left is broad. From the left corner to the bottom right corner, that is Morris Street, and you could see the proposed building. Let's see, I do have a pointer here. Um, uh, it, you see the proposed mixed-use development that generally runs along uh, Broad Street. Uh, this development is approximately 140 units uh, with approximately 10,000 square feet of retail space, and there'll be parking uh, underneath. There will be two access points proposed. One is along Morris, um, and I'm trying to show it on the my uh, cursor, but again, I know it's not the best uh, 
uh, contrast of colors. And then the other access point off of Cedar Street would be the access to the um, interior parking garage inside the building. So in terms of what this project will generate in terms of traffic, and you heard from my previous uh, or earlier discussion, we collected volumes in 2021, adjusted them to 2018, then comes in how much more traffic are we gonna be expected with this overall development? So obviously there's two components to this, this site. There's a residential component and there's a retail component. And to come up with the trip generation of those uses, our industry utilizes the Institute of Transportation Engineers Trip Generation Manual. What this is, is traffic engineers like myself or Brian have sat and counted sites that are in operation, count the number of cars that go in them, the amount of cars that go out of them, the amount of people that go in them, the amount of people that go out of them, the amount of bikes that go in and out of them. And basically, based on, um, based on these observations, we could project what future developments would generate. So, for example, here with 140 units, there are samples within our publications that may have 100 unit developments, 180 unit developments, 200 unit developments, and basically you come up with a formula, how many units are you proposing, what's, and then you putting that into the calculation will tell you how much traffic would you be expected to generate. Obviously, not all sites are, are the same. There's a lot of studies that are done in suburban areas where there's no train nearby, there's no downtown nearby. And so engineers like myself and Brian, there are a multitude of calculations we go through to come up with what is the right mix for this location. So we look at census data, how many people commute via car versus train versus bus in this general area, how many people own cars in this general area specific to Summit, and that was all part of our analysis. Also the location of the site is very important because of the mix of uses. If you could go to grab coffee without getting in your car, that's one less trip in the car category, which is the one on the right, one more in the pedestrian category. So what Brian and myself do as part of this process is to come up with the ultimate trip generation of this site. And what you see here is a graphic of the peak hour volume based on the calculations we came up with for residential, uh, the residential portion of development from a pedestrian standpoint, a bicycle standpoint, and a vehicle standpoint. And the numbers, that's a pure one-to-one -one ratio. So if you count the number of you know, little cars that are located on the AM uh, spot, that's the number of cars that would be generated in the busiest hour in the morning based on our calculations. It's roughly, uh, I believe that's roughly uh, 22 in the, uh, sorry, uh, 18 in the PM rush hour, 26 in the morning rush hour for the, uh, for the car bicyclist. And my eyes are uh, a little tired, but it's about seven in the morning, about five in the evening. And then again, pedestrians are looking at about 17 in the morning and 12 in the evening in terms of during that busiest rush hour that this site would generate from a residential point of view. Um, it, these, these volumes that we've basically calculated, we add that into the counts that we had performed to come up with how, what would the impacts be at the various intersections throughout the city. We also did this for the retail component as well. Obviously retail, it's, it's a little more difficult to pin down because you don't know who the exact tenants are. If you have a, if you have a, a uh, restaurant that serves, you know, kind of coffee and breakfast items, you likely won't have a lot of rush hour in the evening. You may have it in the morning. Uh, same type of thing if you have certain uses that may not be open at all in the morning, maybe only open in the afternoon and the evening. So we did the same exercise for the, for the retail uses. Based on uh, Brian's uh, recommendations, we utilized um, what we would consider conservative uses, basically the highest generating uses. What would be kind of the worst case scenario? Almost if 7-Eleven moved in, you know, from across the street, moved into this development, and all that traffic comes to the site, what would that generate to this location? But again, I would just emphasize that retail can be kind of a moving target because until you know what that tenant is, it's, it's somewhat up in the air. But all of our analysis that we performed was based on kind of that worst case scenario for retail. I want to show a comparison because on this last slide, you see all these cars and bikes and people that would be generated from the site from a res residential point of view. But what does it compare to the actual volumes on the road? So this slide here um, shows the traffic volumes along Morris Avenue in the existing condition, basically in 2021 if there was no pandemic. That is that pink line. So in the morning and evening rush hours along Morris Avenue, you're talking about about 1,000 cars driving by this site in the busiest hours. 
The amount of traffic we'd be adding to Morris Avenue is that little cyan strip that's located on the right-hand side of this graph. So when you're looking at what you would expect, the typical person that's driving through Summit along Morris Avenue in the morning, they're going to see the addition of that little cyan bar over the amount of volume that's currently on the road, which is that, that pink, uh, pink piece. So again, I wanted to kind of uh, give a little feel because again, when you just look at this, this chart and you see, hey, there's 26 cars, what does that really mean? What does that do to my commute? Really, that's about one car every two minutes. So if you sat at a driveway and you sat there and you waited, or if I didn't talk for two minutes, it would feel like a really long period of time. That's how long, that, that's how often a car would possibly come out of this driveway. So I just wanted to give those kind of comparisons um, in terms of, you know, so you could see and feel what the type of residential uh, trip generation demand would be for a site like this. Then comes the traffic improvements. Um, obviously, one of the reasons to prepare a traffic study like this is to identify where can we make improvements, uh, you know, to the overall roadway network. And it's important to note that there aren't necessarily some severe, what we call level of service um, uh, uh, detriments based on this development. And level of services in our industry, intersections are graded from an A through F scale. A basically means there's plenty of capacity. F means there's, uh, your, your, your capacity is limited. It's basically over capacity. It's important to note that this level of volume doesn't necessarily click and, and create, you know, one car every two minutes doesn't necessarily make an intersection go from operating well to operating poorly. But obviously, we're looking at a, uh, a confluence of some additional traffic volumes, some additional pedestrian volumes, and some intersections that don't quite operate great today. So we kind of identified a couple of those intersections that could use some improvement. So specific to this, uh, this uh, subdistrict, we looked at intersections of Morris and Broad, Chestnut and Broad, Broad Street and Cedar, and Broad Street and Maple in terms of looking for the opportunity to make a number of improvements specifically aligned with the safety of these intersections. So, for example, the intersection of Chestnut and Broad, and I'll kind of go back and forth between the slides, we'd be looking at making sure that we have a uh, improved pedestrian visibility. Basically, this is, you know, almost be right at the front door of this proposed development to be able to cross over to, to Chestnut with these kind of rapid flashing beacons. I know are elsewhere in the city. Uh, I know the city has some of the, I would say, original models of this. Uh, there are some uh, significant upgrades or updates to, the, to this technology. We're seeing it more and more. They have very, very high levels of driver compliance. When a pedestrian pushes the button, they get the immediate flashers go on. It's good for the pedestrians. They know action's happening. It's good for the driver. They know that a, a pedestrian may be popping out. It's great when you kind of have, you know, twilight time periods, people coming home from the train, although I don't know how much longer we're going to switch the clocks, but, you know, when you're walking home from the train in the, uh, the dark, um, you know, these type of uh, high, uh, high visibility performance uh, signs are, are key. Some other improvements we're looking at is um, at the signalized intersection of Broad and Maple. Um, additional pedestrian improvements, the intersection, I don't believe, meets latest ADA standards. Uh, in addition, the, um, I would say one of the, the main uh, trends in promoting pedestrian safety is called a lead pedestrian interval. There may be some of these elsewhere within the city, but basically what it means, traditionally at a traffic light, when you get your walk signal, it's the same time that the car gets their green light. What that does is it becomes somewhat of a race of the pedestrian steps off the sidewalk and the car wants to make the right turn and they're kind of in conflict. And the pedestrian isn't in a great a spot of visibility for the driver because it's somewhat at their kind of right side and the driver's looking at the light and they go to make the turn. What a lead pedestrian interval does is it gives the walk usually between anywhere between three to five seconds of a head start before the light turns green. So that pedestrian gets potentially, depending on how fast they walk, fully across the intersection, halfway across the intersection, but at least in a better point of visibility before the driver's light turns green and the driver goes. So those are the type of improvements that we were looking at and we kind of identified the intersection of uh, Broad and Maple as being a, a key location where residents of this building would be walking to the train, potentially other people in the area may be walking to the future retail here, and that being a, a key point of improvement uh, at that location. We also are proposing streetscape uh, improvements along the entirety of uh, Broad Street and Cedar Street as part of this subdistrict. There's a list of standards as part of the redevelopment plan that obviously we will comply with. Uh, but that'll be all part of, of this, uh, this sub-district improvement. 
We also identified a couple of other intersection improvements that the redeveloper is committed to providing um, a fair share contribution to these intersections. These intersections are a little bit further from um, the, the proposed subdistrict, but was identified as uh, potential areas where there could be some safety improvements. A little difficult to see, but I'll try to describe what's on the left-hand side. Uh, the left-hand side is the intersection, sorry, of um, Broad and Summit. Uh, at that intersection, you basically have two through lanes in each direction on Mar, uh, sorry, that should be Morris, sorry, it's Morris and Summit. Uh, two through lanes in each direction. Um, what you have is somewhat of a drag race feel when the light turns green where both cars try to get into through the light at the same time. You also sometimes have a car in the left lane waiting to make a left. You're the car behind them. You want to go through. You kind of make that last second kind of shift to the right and around. That's typically not great in terms of uh, trying to prevent accidents. So what we've looked here is the ability to install left turn lanes um, and basically have a left lane be left turn only and the right lane be straightened through. So you basically eliminate both the kind of drag race feel and you eliminate that propensity of side swipe accidents where the car who's behind the left turning car kind of tries to kick over. So this is the type of improvements that again, this traffic study kind of uncovered. I know obviously the county, this is a county intersection. I know there's been conversations that the city has had with the county about these type of improvements. And we think that's obviously uh, advantageous at this location. In addition, on the right hand, uh, the bottom, that's again just an example of the, the lead pedestrian phase that we would look to implement or work with the city to implement along basically the entirety of this corridor. Really, it seems like a no-brainer from all these study intersections to kind of you know, uh, start implementing that type of um, pedestrian safety measure across the entirety of, you know, of, of Summit. Again, where you have large levels of pedestrians, that's one of the easiest ways to improve pedestrian safety. Um, so overall, again, these were kind of the conclusions of the traffic study. There were 600 pages and about uh, six submissions and back and forth with your consultant to kind of get to this answer. Uh, but uh, again, this is, I think, uh, hopefully a little quick overview of what we had uh, determined as part of this, this uh, project. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to now open it up to members of council if they have any questions. <clears throat> uh, council Member Bartan. Thank you, Council President. I have a bunch. Um, so if I'm doing too many, just stop me. Um, so <laughs> thank you uh, for the questions. Uh, thank you for answering the questions about when the traffic study took place. I also appreciate the way that you spoke about how you accounted for the pandemic. Um, this traffic study and, and your report has been paid for through the escrow account that has been uh, provided by the developer, right? So in other words, your work is complete and you have no financial stake in whether this actually gets built, right? My my work was paid for by the redeveloper. Correct. Your reviewer was your review was paid for by the escrow. Correct. So okay. there's you know we both don't have any financial stake to be honest. Excellent. So um, can you just explain a little bit more about why more streets are included in this study than in a typical study, and why there aren't more streets even than these that that you've done so far? Yeah. Again, I, I mean. I wasn't the writer of the redevelopment plan, so I could only opine on that, but I would state one, obviously this is a single sub-district, a part of a larger redevelopment plan. Two, I do think that there is a kind of inner working of a kind of a downtown where, you know, even though our cars may only drive through one or two intersections before they kind of leave the network, there may be a pedestrian that kind of walks through uh, other areas. So again, it seems very comprehensive. You know, I would also say that it's, you know, the writers of the redevelopment plan weren't the ones paying for the traffic study, so it seemed like an opportunity to get a lot of information that could be used for future things like grant writing or, or uh, you know, future potential improvements in the area. Perfect. Um, so what is the actual peak AM hour? Is it 7 to 8, or is it 8 to 9? What's the actual yeah. morning? So the actual peak hour is, I believe, 7.30 to 8.30. Let me just get it for you. And then the yeah, evening? 7.30 to 8.30 is the morning peak hour. Um, then we kind of had a, the school dismissal, which was like 2.45 to 3.45. 4 to 5 p.m. Was the, was the evening, and 12 to 1 was the Saturday. Okay. Um, and so how can, you know, I think it's hard for people to understand, you know, if there's 140 apartment units, how do you actually figure out when they're going to leave their apartment yeah. in the morning? We, you know, can you yeah. explain a little so, of the methodology? So there? roughly, if this was built in, I would say, a non-transit oriented area. 
what you typically would look at for a multifamily is about half the, half the unit leaves in a single hour. So if you had 100 units, 50 of them would leave in a single hour, and then you, you know, it's somewhat of a kind of bell curve effect. There may be 25% in the hour before, maybe 25% in the hour after. Some people don't work. Some people may be taking their children to school, a little off hours or daycare. But typically, the rough, tra you know, the rough thought, if you have no train, no bus, no transit, approximately half the unit, would, half the number of units would leave during a single hour. Okay. Um, so what's the percentage of cars that we're adding versus... That exist? The, the, yeah. So that would be generally this type of discussion. So again, roughly, you know, you're looking at, and again, this is just residential. So if you, you blend sure. in, there's obviously some retail, and again, there's some retail that won't generate anything in the morning, some retail that will generate some. I mean, you're looking at usually about, you know, less than 2% increase in traffic from a vehicular standpoint. Okay, on the roads. and I'm assuming it's wrong to think about it this way. But is it correct to think about it that it'll take you then 2% longer than it would have to get through wherever you're going, so, right? So like, that's not the right way to think it, about it, it, but I'm just hoping you'll explain it. Yeah, it's not purely, well, I mean, my industry would be much easier if I could just make uh, blanket statements like that. But just the sure. way that I typically look at it is if you have a car leaving every two minutes and you get to the traffic and you're, you know, from this site and you're just a driver unrelated to this project and you happen to come to the Broad and, and Morris intersection. I would say about twice during that week, there may be one more car in front of you at the light. Now, you know, whether you're the third person at the light or the fourth person at the light, you might be going through the same green light. So really, maybe no change at all. Okay. You know, if that car during one of those two times he's in front of you got through on that yellow and you waited on the red, you know, you have to, you know, you missed the light. So maybe that's, you know, once a week, once every two weeks type of, type of occasion. But, okay. you know, typically, you know, that level of traffic doesn't, kick it into a spot where there may be um, maybe impacts. Typically in this industry, we look at 100 trips in an hour. If you send 100 new trips to an hour in a, to a specific intersection, that may, and again, the answer is may, create additional delays that may have to be looked at a little more carefully. So again, you know, if you had 100 trips to an intersection that has no traffic now, it won't be an impact. But if you have 100 trips new going through a very busy intersection, you know, that's, you know, that's about a little less than two a minute might create additional traffic okay. impacts. And then one, one more question, if that's okay. Um, so driving around Summit doesn't make one a traffic expert. Uh, but I guess the question that most people will be asking or, or thinking is, what if you're wrong, right? So, <laughs> so can you speak to a little bit of the methodology behind, I guess, how do you analyze in other developments wh whether you are accurate or not? So we do post studies at a number of locations. So there are projects that we worked on. It could be a warehouse, it could be an office building, it could be residential. We sit and we count post-operation. I'll tell you this just from experience. I'm working on a project right now in Westfield. Similar multifamily type development. There was another one that was built probably opened about five or six years ago. So what we did is we looked at what we were going to project for the traffic to be generated, went to this development that's in operation, counted their driveways, and we actually were overestimating in our new traffic study compared to what was, was in operation that was built a few years, you know, five, six years ago. So it's those type of studies that, you know, we perform to let us know that we're, we're on the right track with these type of projections. That's great. And, and I would say the other piece is you don't generate traffic without parking. If you don't have, you know, so if this is a project and you were saying we need to have four parking spaces for every unit, so all of a sudden your head, you're thinking about, okay, now we're talking about 400 parking spaces, 500 parking spaces. You'd be thinking about, okay, we'd be talking about a different level of traffic that could be generated versus this development, which has obviously a specific number of parking spaces, only so much traffic that could be generated by it. Sure. You, you know, people aren't, le you know, leaving three times in the morning out of, you know, with, out of one parking space. Right. That was it for me. Thank you very much. So I have one question just sure. to clarify something you said. You said um, half of the units leave in a single hour if no transit. You assume that if there's no transit in the area. But in our case, we've got transit in the area. So what is yeah. your assumption? Yeah, so I was talking from a vehicular standpoint yes. only. So mm -hmm. obviously with this type of development, you know, you're talking about something in the range of 25 trips being generated out of 140 units. So that calculation is probably 20%. Um, Okay. would be leaving in a single uh, in a single hour. 
But you also, then you have pedestrians. Yeah, right? that's, yeah, that's why, so that's you know, that if, if this was being built in Rockaway, New Jersey, it would be, everything would be on the right-hand side. Okay. Nothing would be on the left-hand so side. So you're comparing the, the half to this. Yes, so. exactly. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. Uh, any other council members have any questions? Council Member Ninniger. Thank you, Council President. Um, you mentioned there were six iterations back and forth among the two teams. Um, and I know you agree on the, the final version now. What was, a, like, say, the major disagreement that you had, the top one? I, I don't know if there was a major dis I mean, there's always technical refinement that can be done. There was discussion about trip generation, as I mentioned, the retail component. You know, we, there are different retail users. You know, your, um, your traffic expert, again, uh, insisted that we look at, you know, convenience store being one of the uses in this building because it generates a lot of traffic. Our initial submission assumed it was just general dry retail, likely, you know, you know, a type of store that wouldn't generate a lot of traffic. So I wouldn't say it was, a, you know, we didn't butt heads, we didn't come to blows, but that was again one of the kind of uh, you know discussions and iterations that kind of we went through through this process. Okay. Um, and just to clarify, that doesn't mean that there's going to be a convenience store. We use that as just like our worst case scenario, traffic wise. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. And again, I, I I'm not the leasing agent, but I don't anticipate a convenience stores want to go across the street from a 7-Eleven right. that has an easy parking lot to pull in and out of versus this development right. here. So I just wanted the audience yeah. to hear that so we yeah. don't have any you yeah. know, concern about that. Yes. Um, uh, Council Member Hurston. Thank you, Council President. Uh, Mr. Seckler, thank you for this uh, presentation. I'd like to hear a little bit about your background when you talk about other, you've done, I think you said like hundreds, maybe even thousands of these traffic studies. And um, if you could tell us about one similar to this particular redevelopment project prior to um, the pandemic, so I, I wanted to take you back. And um, I would like you to um, keep in mind, and I want to know if this is a part of your study, that our aim is to improve what is already a dense traffic area. And so I want to hear you talk about your previous studies and how when you make recommendations, you incorporate them. Certainly, and again, I, I, I could bring up dozens of them and I'm trying to piece together which one would be most useful here. One that comes to mind, there is a Again, a little bit smaller, about 50, 60 unit development immediately next door to our office in Rutherford. So Rutherford's on a train line. It's two stops to Hoboken, but it doesn't go direct to the city, but has bus also in the area. Mixed use development, retail on the first floor facing out, uh, residential above. Um, and for us, you know, we are the building, I'd say, immediately next door to it. So their parking issues would affect us. Their traffic issues would affect us. So that is a traffic study that we performed, again, that we've seen get built. We then worked on phase two, which is now under construction. You know, the, the, the municipality, you know, I guess enjoyed the development that happened. We went for phase two, an additional building. Um, so that was one that we worked on. But in trying to think of the recommendations, we also worked on a project in South Orange. Um, again, I'm just trying to think of areas that are on trains that have good, you know, transit, good multi modal type um, arrangements. That one is still under construction, but it did include a number of development uh, pieces like here. We looked at bump outs, you know, trying to make sure we, we shrunk the, the um, intersections so the pedestrians weren't crossing large streets. Um, you know, they had a lot of stop sign uh, areas. They didn't want pedestrians crossing over. That also had a lot of, again, parking, um, parking, uh, interest because we were building over an existing parking lot. So it was similar to here, where's the parking gonna go? That was, again, those type of questions that were raised as part of that. Um, trying to think of a couple other, I mean, a lot of projects, you know, are near completion. So I'm trying to think of ones that, you know, have been open and we'd be able to see and study afterwards. Again, the one in Rutherford, because we, you know, I, I walk by it every day is the one that really sticks out the most to it. We've worked on a bunch of other uh, project in Verona. That one is open. It was an old, uh, old uh, factory uh, on Bloomfield Avenue, converted into loft-style apartments. Mm -hmm. Again, same type of thing. We same went in areas. looking for different parking ratios than what the what the town had originally typically thought of. 
um, you know, worked through the, this parking, you know, arrangement, came up with the fact that we thought that, you know, I think 1.2 parking space per unit was appropriate for that type of location. Project's up, open, operating. We do continue to work with that developer. They've, you know, they let us study their parking garage as part of, uh, you know, other projects, and it's never been fully occupied. Uh, you know, so those are the type of stuff that we've done as part of our, our work. So are you taking away any information that's helping you uh, get better each time or any, uh, anything in particular that stands out to you? I, I would say, again, I've always, there are traffic engineers that are build, 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 widen, widen, widen traffic engineers. Ones that say, if it's not level of service B, it's not good enough. We need to widen, we need, and I've, I have a planning background, I have a master's in planning, so I've always had the thought of, you know, good urban design, you know, think of all three modes of transportation or multi modes of transportation. I think that's only been in, in you know, as I've seen it more and more in action, it's been something that I've been more, more passionate about. Mm -hmm. So I think that is probably what I've taken most out of these projects is looking at, you know, how could you, how can you make the roadways not necessarily you know, a car getting through the intersection at 35 miles an hour, to me, is not as beneficial as making sure the pedestrian gets across the street in the easiest fashion. Um, we've worked on a project in Morristown um, that's under construction now. Um, they have the seeing eye there, um, uh, you know, the um, uh, guided dog um, kind of training area, and we're putting a roundabout there, and we worked with the seeing eye to make sure that it was accessible to them. They actually liked it because they could train if they have a, a, a dog and a that's going to be going to an area that has roundabouts, they want to be able to train on it. So it's that type of stuff that I would say I've learned over time mm -hmm. is, you know, I had, when I started the project, I had no idea, you know, how to kind of work with the visually impaired on, a, on an intersection design. So that's, I'd say, what I've been adding to my, my repertoire. Thank you. Okay, are there any other questions from members of council? Yeah, I have uh, a, I have council a member of Sullivan. Yeah, thank you, council president, and thank you. Uh, I'm relieved <clears throat> that it was a more in-depth presentation than the 10 slides that I received this yeah. morning. And um, it was really not, there was no context. So, yeah. I, 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 I try to, you know, when you put too much stuff on a slide, it, people tend not to focus, so I tried to balance it between the two. Yeah, well, I'm <laughs> glad you put context to it because more information is better. So those 600 pages, you know, put them out, I would say. Um, <laughs> Is, is there something is sort of in between so, 600 well, pages that could be that, posted? Well, that's searchable on... by a keyword or a searchable document, something like that. So, so people just so people have it if they want it. It's there. Um, the ten slides really like some of these icons. I yeah. was like, what is? Yeah. Does that mean ten people? Per, you know, per yeah. per. Uh, anyway, um, so a couple of things. Um, you're counting pedestrians, but what about people that? If this building is as nice as we think it's going to be, maybe even more people want to walk by it. So did you count those pedestrians that may be coming through as well? More kids walking to school because now it's safer than just, you know, paved parking lots. So I guess the, the piece that we, I would say, did account for is that when we looked at both the retail and the residential components, we had a pedestrian, bike, and car number. So again, as the retail may draw people to the area, that was accounted for. Now... I'd say people changing their behaviors. Yeah. Um, I don't know if we've accounted for that uh, as part of this. Obviously, we could always boost up the, the pedestrian volumes, but I think the key was here is that the, the improvements that we can make for pedestrians, it doesn't matter if there's 10 people walking by or 100 people walking by. If you add the lead pedestrian interval, the walk ahead of time, that's, that's good for everybody. So it's not like we need to hit a threshold before we would implement that. So... Again, definitely something that, you know, working with your traffic engineer, we could look at boosting kind of a, um, uh, you know, latent demand, you know, uh, you know, kind of, uh, you know, the influence of this being a more desirable area, we definitely can. But I think the improvements are well built for or well designed for any amount of pedestrian traffic. Okay. And then uh, the next slide, <clears throat> if you just click over to it so everybody can see, you mentioned the accident analyses. You didn't mention that tonight in your presentation, yep. as far as what accidents happened or, you know, yep. so outcomes. What, what we did as part of our study is that at all these intersections, we looked for if there was any trends in accidents. So specifically the one on Mars that we're looking to change the two through lanes 
to one, yes. we, there was a history of side swipe accidents. So we basically look at that, you know, there are driver error all over the place. But the idea is, is there a trend? Is there something that looks like there's a contributing factor? Now, one of the intersections, the intersection of Locust, uh, Broad, and Mars, obviously right on our corner, a little offset intersection, we looked at the accident history there. That was specifically requested as part of the redevelopment plan, and there did not seem to be any specific accident history that, you know, led us to believe that that needed to be realigned or, you know, or I would say significantly improved. You know, that you could always add lead pedestrian intervals, those type of things, but there wasn't anything that, you know, and again, you have your, your board, your, um, um, your traffic consultant as well, but that's what we did at each of the intersections. We went through, is there a trend in accidents? If there is, what would be the remedy to fix it? And that's basically how we went through. So again, that there is portions of that in the traffic study. The traffic study does not include the list of every accident report. Usually, that's you know we'd have to white out every name and mm -hmm. address and things like that. Uh, but um, that was part of the you know the, the collection process here. Okay, and then um, a couple of more slides. Can you just forward so everybody can see um, the next one and the next one. That one. Yep. So you're showing there where people are going to come out and, and go back in off of Morris Avenue. So if they're coming from the west and they want to get into there and they want to take a left and cross traffic there, um, is that is going to be a, an allowable turn to go in that way and cross traffic? And so you're talking about the site driveway in Morris Avenue? That's the one Yeah, the driveway do. there. If I'm coming from, say, Chatham, going home at night yep. or at rush hour, and think about at rush hour, how packed that those roads can be. Can I take a left to go into my house? Yeah, so we, we analyzed it as having that availability because that would be the most conservative and worst case scenario. Yeah. The county, and again, I was not party to the meeting with the county that the city and the representatives had. If the county says right in, right out only, right in, right out only. We have no issue. You know, again, it, it would, we would look at you know, what would be the worst case scenario would be left turn to that intersection. And you did that? What? Worst case scenario. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. And then uh, last one for me is, um, so we've talked about para we've talked about street parking as part of this on Broad Street. Yes. Um, and so, you know, I'm not the greatest parker in the world. So when people parallel park and how that affects, um, you know, traffic behind you, you know, we see it on Springfield Avenue as an example, but did you take that into effect where people are parallel parking and kind of gumming everything up? Where there's existing parking we did. So as part of our counts, again, we didn't just count cars and pedestrians. We also counted bus arrivals. We counted um, vehicular uh, parking maneuvers as well. Um, also, we flew, we flew drones in the area to get, you know, again, that global thing. Because when we count a single intersection, you're, you know, you're looking you know, solely at one spot. We wanted to see how the overall network uh, looked. But we did account for existing parking maneuvers on the roads that parking is permitted. Very good. And just one more thing, because I do like the, the lead time to give the walker a head start. And just as uh, just as suggestion, because we have them all over town and other towns have them too, the countdown. Yes. When people see that countdown, they hit the gas. They want to make that light. I, I, I don't know if we need to go, you know. Yeah, the, those countdowns are they're, they're, they're they're federally, a mixed bag. They're federally required as part of new intersections. That said, when they first came out, my thought was exactly the same as yours. I was like, has anyone done the study of, you know, cars that run through the lights because they could tell it's, you know, and, or stopping short? I haven't seen any studies come out, but it is federally yes. required now to have the countdown. The time. countdown is, okay. You almost want it to, like, be like, you should be leaving now, and then almost the countdown just disappears, and then you don't know exactly when the light will turn red, but that's not <laughs> how it works. Yeah. That's all I have. Thank you, Council President. Thank you. Um, Council Member Allen? Yep. Thank yep. you, Council President. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Seklar. This is great. Um, uh, first question. So after your 600 pages, is your conclusion that this corner with the 140 apartments and the 10,000 square feet can handle the traffic that this building would generate? Is that your conclusion? Yes, that'd be much quicker of tonight if I just came up and said that. But yes, that was that was my <laughs> conclusion. And 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 your uh, board's or your uh, your city's uh, reviewer, I think, echoes it again. I don't want to speak for him, but um, he could, I guess, speak for himself, Brian. In that case. Yeah, we've <clears throat> based on our review uh, and the iterations of the study. Yes, we agree with that. Okay. Um, you had mentioned when you were talking that less parking spaces means less cars for most most of the building, right? So, 
if there's less parking in the building, you're not going to have as much traffic. Did I well, understand that correctly? I, I would say there's obviously a limiting factor there, but yes. The idea was that you could be confident that this site won't generate a unfathomable, you know, a, a number that I couldn't even contemplate being generated because there's limited parking on the site. Again, if this had, if you had unlimited parking and the, the garage just keep growing, growing, growing based on every person that wants to bring in a car, then obviously you'd be looking at, I would say, unconstrained potential traffic. Here, there's only so many cars that come out of this garage because we only have so many parking spaces. So that's kind of a limiting factor. So if we build a parking garage, though, that would be a factor. I would say it depends if that parking garage is satisfying other, if it's replacing other parking fields, you know, then it's, it's just accounting for the existing demand and bringing it in. So again, I, I, don't, I don't know the specifics of a garage you're speaking of, but again, if it's replacing other things, so, you know, parking lots could be better served by other uses, then I don't think it's going to tip the scales. If, if there's demand for it, you know, if you build a parking garage in Iowa, it's not going to add any traffic. You can build a parking garage in, you know, Hoboken and make it more enticing for people to drive and park there, it may. Right. So if we build a five-deck parking garage across the street, will it, will it affect it? Well, again, I can't speak specifically to what those uses are. Again, I'm looking from this development standpoint. If this development isn't using that garage, this development is using that garage, then obviously they're unrelated. If that's serving existing demand, yep. then... I have a point. Um, <laughs> so do you generally, when you look at traffic studies, when you look at the ratio of apartments to parking spots, do the apartments generally not have parking? And I, I apologize if this was, um, if someone already asked this question, I was feverishly writing notes. So when you do a parking study for a apartment building, generally, do those apartment buildings have at least one spot? Does it vary? Do they not have any spots? Does it usually fit? I would say it depends typically on the location. If I'm doing a project in Newark, Hoboken, Jersey City, mm -hmm. may not have any parking related to it all. Some areas, you, they require you have two parking spaces per unit. Um, so again, it depends on really the location, the transit that's available, things, things of that nature. Okay. Um, you said you did almost 200 studies a year and you were working with the county one of my biggest concerns, and this is where I'm getting at with the parking garage, because we are looking at, you know, two other sub-districts at some point. So I know they're on hold, but I just think about, you know, a few years from now. So there's been a lot of development downtown. I have not been shy about how I'm concerned about the traffic and the parking downtown and how all the parking around us and the traffic will, I'm sorry, the building around us and the different towns will affect us. So when you work with Union County, have you guys said to Union County, what building is going on in the near, in the neighboring towns, and is there any accounting for the type of traffic that's gonna be generated with the hundreds and potentially thousands of apartments that are being built around us, even though it's not in Summit? So I'll give two answers, or I'll give one, and I'll punt the one to, to somebody else. As part of these studies, what we typically use is a background growth factor. Basically accounts for future volume, future, future growth on the roadways, between when we do the counts and when the site would basically be built in operation. What that accounts for, and that New Jersey Department of Transportation basically publishes this data based on the county you're in and the type of roads that you're on. Basically looking, I'd say somewhat backwards versus forwards, they basically look at what are the traffic trends been over time? Has it traffic been going up 1% a year, 2% a year, 3% a year? That's what they've typically looked at. So they look basically three years in the past, look at this year and say, Traffic's been going up 3%. So what we use, and we would use that value and say, okay, it's going up 3% a year, every year, so that when we do the counts, we basically add on this kind of multiplier to it. So that's what was used as part of this project. We also, you know, if there are nearby projects, we would account for that as well. Specific, we're developing on this corner, and let's say where 7-Eleven is, there was going to be a 10-story building, we would obviously get that traffic report, account for it, because it's right in, you know, it's going to have a direct impact on this site here. Those are the two pieces that we normally utilize. I don't know, Brian, if when you met with the county, if there was any, you know, or Aaron, if there was any, you know, discussions about other outside developments outside of, I guess, downtown summit. No, the, the, the uh, other developments wasn't a topic of discussion. Okay. 
So what's the 3%? What are you basing that? Oh, sorry. Okay, so I, I, I was using 3% as a, a for instance. Oh. Let me get the exact value that was used in the report just so it's clear. But it is a published um, percentage by the Department of Transportation. And again, it, they typically look at trends in traffic over the last X period of time, usually three years in time, and look that oh, traffic's been going up. Okay. We're going to tell everyone that they should account for uh, X percent growth. It looks like it was 1% compounded annually uh, over three years. So it was 1%, 1%, 1% okay. to get to 2024. I do feel like there's a lot more development, though. I, I mean, I don't know if it's that 3%, but we have 3,000 apartments going up around us. So I don't, it's, I don't know. I just, I'm wondering if that is something that would be a consideration. So um, the kids. So what's happening is, is when people, when parents drive to school in the morning, they're, they're racing from one school to the next. So is that accounted for? Because it is nearly impossible to get to the school some days. And um, are we accounting for potentially people rerouting in, through the neighborhoods? So are you referring to kids in this building or kids currently in Summit being driven to other schools? So the traffic study around the building is right across the street from the yes. middle school. Yes. So there are <coughs> hundreds of kids. So I'm, actually, yep. you just brought up a good question. Are all of those hundreds of kids that are walking, are they accounted for? Yep. I'm assuming so. Yes. But people will reroute around that area if it gets too congested. So even if you think about Morris Avenue and you come down the, the hill on the bridge and you turn left, that gets backed up. There could be 15, 20 cars almost backed up to the light. So are we thinking about how traffic might be rerouting itself? So I'll, again, try to answer it in two ways and hopefully get to the something that was what you were looking for. Um, when we did the counts, we specifically counted during school arrival and dismissal. We saw the huge speak, spike that you get at you know, basically over 15 minutes when parents are dropping off. You know, the crossing people are there. They kind of create almost quasi bump outs and trying to get the kids across the street. We accounted for all that in our analysis. In fact, we did a specific look at that 15 minutes and then like, what's the rest of the morning rush hour like? Because once that 15 minute leaves, it calms down considerably in the area a little bit after that again. So that is accounted for in our traffic study. Um, we counted actual traffic volumes. So we, if people are diverting themselves today, that was captured in our report. So if someone decides to use Broad Street today because they don't want to come down Summit or they don't want to come down Maple, that's in our report. I don't know what people's plans will be in the future, but again, we counted however traffic operates on a typical September day you know, when school was in session. So however the parents decided to drive that specific day, that was accounted for in our study. Okay. And I think the biggest, two of the biggest concerns people have are parking and, and traffic. So I've kind of put you in the hot seat and I feel like you're probably in the hot seat tonight. So I really appreciate you answering the questions. Um, one question I do have, because parking and traffic are hand in hand, um, and I apologize if this is in the 600 page report. So, <laughs> um, did you account for all the parking we have in town? I don't think, I think the answer is no, but did you consider all the parking that's currently in town? And if parking goes away, because it will go away to some degree with this building, what is the impact of that? When you say parking goes away with this building, you mean the actual surface lot that you're referring to? Cause, yeah. Okay, because I, I think there are plans to have additional on-street parking as part of this project. So I do think there'll be obviously a portion that will be replaced with on-street parking. Um, in terms of the effects of the removal of this, the parking field that's there today, that I think was looked at in uh, another consultant's report. It was the Tim Haas study. That was basically, an over, it was a general city of summit parking analysis where they looked at it again holistically, you know, what do you have available in this garage? What do you have on this street? What do you have on this street? And basically they had done a, a parking study uh, that looked at, you know, overall, can the city support not having 100 and whatever, uh, 70 whatever spaces that this lot has um, and, and support that elsewhere within the city. And again, this project will be adding on-street parking. Um, you know, if, if approved, and obviously it's a council action, uh, along, um, along Broad and, and the county seem to be open to being allowing it on Morris Street as well. Morris Avenue, sorry. Okay. Um, actually, Council, uh, Councilman O'Sullivan made me think of something. So when you come out of that building, instead of turning left, when you turn right, you're actually right at the light. So, so how does that work? So it's, it's going to be tough to see. 
It's probably so about point. four vehicles south of the light. So this is the exit? Yes. Uh -oh. So you have about you know, four to five vehicles between where the stop bar would be and your exit. Oh, oops, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I'll give you my card. <laughs> <laughs> Should have known. Stay by the podium with the microphone. Yeah, my card's right here. Yeah, okay. <laughs> the, um, um, yeah, so, and again, the, the, one of the benefits of this project is it does not have a single point of ingress or egress. If you're a resident of this building, you start, just like, as you mentioned, if you drop your kids off at school every day, you know, hey, listen, I gotta go down this street instead of this street because it backs up. So what typically happens is, as a resident of the building, if you're leaving at 10 o'clock in the morning, you'll go out that driveway, it won't be a care in the world to make a right turn. You wanna leave, as you said, at you know, probably you know, right when school is kind of being dismissed or you, you know, people are dropping off down at Washington, you know, it kind of backs up the whole way down Mars. Yeah, you might be going out the other way and just avoiding that stretch of the roadway. So again, it, traffic engineering is, engineering and also somewhat of a sociology piece where people end up finding their own way. It's like water. So if that becomes a backup problem, they'll go out the other direction. Okay, I'm done. Thank you, Council President. Thank you. All right, um, I had one other question, just a clarification. Um, you talked about after, de after development, you sometimes go back and, and do an analysis. How close are your predictions? Can you give us a percentage yeah. or some sense of how close you are to what actually it is? Uh, I would honestly say typically we overestimate slightly. Mm -hmm. um, I would say usually it's 10%. Again, sometimes it depends on the retail. If we're doing a retail development, you know, and, and we don't know Starbucks is going in, you know, with the drive through and we're just doing retail, yeah, we're, our morning numbers may be off a little bit. But we've, we've had uh, projects in which the municipality had, um, I would say, escalators against the developer if, traffic reached a certain level or requirements that you, they had to install a traffic signal or, or you know, do some sort of mitigating factor, and we've never had to do one as part of our projects. So either our, volume, our counts have been acceptable or the level of traffic, even if it was slightly above, didn't trigger, I would say, a punishment or an escalator against the development itself. Okay, thank you. Um, so I, now what, since council's all had a shot at this, I'm gonna open it up to members of the public. So um, probably the best thing, Mr. Seckler, is if you, you want to just there? have a seat yeah. here, we'll let the uh, public have the podium, um, and then uh, the two of you can field whatever questions are appropriate. So come I think on it's up. Brian's time to talk. Okay. <laughs> no. <laughs> you guys fight it out. <laughs> Do you need some water? I'm okay. Um, you sure? Yeah, no, it's okay. It's, no. it's unopened. No, it's, uh, okay. okay. Yeah. I'll take it. Yeah, just in case. yeah. it's yeah. not not Don't super go that cold. Way. But <laughs> yeah, come this way. Okay, and if you can please state your name and your address. Um, Steve Sartorius, 37 Tulip Street in Summit. I have uh, two nits and then one um, kind of more fundamental question. Uh, it looks to me like this is very much kind of a macro uh, study about kind of large areas in Summit. But two little points. Um, did you examine or think about the impact of having uh, parts of downtown summit closed during the summer hours, during the summer uh, months? I know the council has shut down Maple Street, right, so that restaurants can uh, go in. So our analysis was done what's called, what's during typical times, so when school's in session, that type of time period. Um, obviously, yes, I mean, I, I was in Summit this past summer and saw the, you know, the open streets and eat, being able to eat outside, outside Finn and, and places like that, um, you know, independent of this project. And my other nit is um, I'm a, uh, a user of the, of the YMCA, and the, the part of the Y right by Cedar Street, particularly like about 6.30, 7, 7.30 at night, there are a lot of kids coming and going from swim practice, swim meets, things like that. There's a lot of tra there's a lot of activity there, um, and that would be right smack across the street from this building. And I gather we're one of the places where people would you know enter into parking. Was anybody was that looked at at all or thought about? Yeah. So again, our, our analysis um, studied in the afternoon from 2:30 p.m. to 6:30 p.m. Um, when we look at you know traffic analysis, we look at typically what the overall network's highest volume is. So that's you know. The whole, that whole pink, so you're all these macro more than micro. Exactly. exactly. Like the, 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 the we, small we, area we, stuff. We, we analyze at a micro level, 
so like we studied and have a delay amount for every single one of these intersections during all five time periods that we have. So we have the left turn, the average delay is 12 seconds. The right turn, the average delay is 34. So we dig in and, and provide analysis at a, at a micro level. But when you're looking at what's the peak hour, it looks at it from a, a macro level. What's the, right. wor what's the worst hour in the afternoon in the whole pink region? Um, and then my more fundamental question, I guess part of the selling point of this project is that uh, this is being built as a transit neighborhood, right, because of the proximity to uh, Summit train station. Uh, but as we've seen um, during the pandemic, uh, you know, public transportation ridership has plummeted. Uh, I know I take the train into Hoboken. Um, New Jersey Transit's down about 50%, and it's probably not coming back. Uh, so there's been a fundamental change in how people live and work. Um, and your study is based on 2019 pre-pandemic. How does that translate into this brave new world? I mean, it, I would think it breaks a lot of your fundamental assumptions. I, I would say it's a challenge for us in the traffic engineering industry. However, there's somewhat trade-offs. As people may not be taking transit as much, People also aren't commuting to work as much and working at home, flexible hours, leaving during different right. times. So it's... It may be a trade-off one way or another. It, exactly. Or it could be you're at home and you've got to make two trips or... But you may not be leaving during rush hour. The rush hours, especially what we saw during the pandemic and kind of coming out of it, the morning rush hour tends to be not as severe and a little more spread. Evening, some people that are working from home, they're already doing going to the gym to work out when they would have been you know, on the train coming home from New York. So they may have an additional trip on the road in the afternoon. So again, I would say in the engineering industry, we are carefully monitoring you know, what the trends will be, but I think that's no different than you know, what transit agencies are doing, what office, you know, people that develop office space is doing. I think everyone's kind of living it. But I do think that the fact that if people aren't taking transit, they're likely not commuting and working at home, you know, there's somewhat of a relationship there because not everyone could drive to New York City right. and sit in traffic. You know, at some point when you sit in traffic for three hours, you're either not gonna drive and take the train or not gonna drive and work from home. Right. So or you some... can make the argument that people are working and driving <laughs> to suburban offices. I mean, it's... Again, if the office, you know, New Jersey office has not exactly been on the rise, you know, in terms of a, a recent market, and that's outside of traffic engineering. Right. So no, I, no, no. Sorry for And then maybe on just that. one quickie. Um, lots of slides, lots of nice graphs. What percentage increase in traffic do you think from all this? No, and again, I think that goes to... That looks like 2%. Yeah, about 2% is, is <laughs> what I would basically say. Again, this is, when you look at overall... For 140 units. Because, but again, look at what Morris serves in terms of the neighborhood. It serves a large percentage of Summit's population, which is obviously a lot more than 104 units. Serves, you know, Chatham's, uh, it serves Madison, it serves Mountainside. All that traffic comes through here, and you're talking about 140 units. In terms of the amount of, I'd say, global emphasis that Morris and, you know, some of these roads have, it really is a drop, 140 units is a drop in the bucket when you look at the region that utilizes a county road like Mars. Right. Uh, I would say the, the only, I mean, again, you guys are doing a macro study. The pain points are going to come in small places, somebody trying to parallel park on Broad, somebody trying to pick up a kid from the Y. But anyway, well, thank you. Council President. Yes. I just had, you brought up a good point, I thought. Um, do you know the daily traffic volume in, on these roads? in the day? I'd say yes. I mean, yes. This, That's this just an hour. It's just an hour. I mean, yeah. the, roughly what you typically look at is this is usually anywhere between 8% and 10% of the total day. So if you want to multiply it out, Mars is probably between 10,000 and 15,000 vehicles per day. Right. Probably closer to 15,000. Yep. And broad is probably, I think a, a number I saw is probably like 13,000 yep. or so, right? They're very busy. So when we're talking these numbers, like you said, 140 units, it's not adding as much as we think it's adding on a percentage basis. Because the, the volumes, like you're talking about, people are coming from Chatham, driving to Milburn all day long. They're going through our town, right? These, these are 15,000 cars coming on, using these roads. And we're adding 140 units, and we're saying even if all 140 people get in their car and drive on the same, even if they just drive back and forth, all day long, they're not adding that much. Mm. All day long may be excessive. No, no, no. But yeah, yeah. If, 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 if they leave in the morning, come back in, at night, right. and let's say there's two people in there and they both are moving their car, again, that's 
that's where, when you look at the percentage, it's... On a percentage it, basis. Yes. Right. The impact is... That's it. Council, Council President, can I ask you a question in response to uh, Councilman O'Sullivan? Um, yeah, yes, Go ahead. and I won't ask anymore. Yeah. Um, but that, that's a really good question because I'm curious if you measure time. So for example, when I moved here, I could get from my house by Franklin Elementary down to Glenside in 10 or 15 minutes at three o'clock. Today it'll take me 20 minutes, 30 minutes. So do, does that study account for the actual time it takes when you get somewhere? So twofold. One, again, I tried to boil this down and not go through every single movement of every single intersection, but we analyze every movement that you, uh, at every intersection that you see in pink here on a time basis of delay time. So we come up and say the average delay for making a left turn from Cedar onto Morris is 34 seconds. Then we look at, okay, from Morris, if to go through and on Summit, at the summit intersection could be 13 seconds. I'm just throwing numbers out there. So we look at, again, on a time basis. Now, you could either add up your kind of travel flow through all our intersections and say, okay, this is the amount of delay it takes. There's also things called um, travel time studies, where basically you look at a corridor and you drive it from one side to the other, back and forth, and you basically come up with what's kind of your baseline travel time, and then you come up with, okay, with additional delays here, you may be adding eight seconds, 12 seconds, things like that. And you basically, that is a study that can be done. I once did it on Route 78 from Newark to the Pennsylvania border, back and forth all day long for a week. And basically in anticip anticipation of like a, a new NJDOT project. So it can be done. It can be somewhat actually utilized based on our study. You could kind of back into that um, with this report, at least in the area that's shown here. The next public comment on it. Good evening. Hi, good evening. My name is Monica Margaritas. I'm from 101 Ashwood Avenue. I'm unofficially representing 12 Chestnut Avenue, the senior building. I go there daily to visit my 88-year-old aunt every night to help her out, and I end up helping a bunch of other little friends of hers. Um, there are 129 units, I believe, 125 or 129? 129. 125. Oh, 125, sorry. There are no visitor parking spots at all. There are two spots on Broad Street, and um, my aunt has missed at-home medical appointments because there's no parking for the nurses, home health aides, physical therapists, family and friends. Um, that's an issue. There's also senior members who are uh, waiting for parking spots for their own cars. Mm -hmm. So I have to get dropped off and get picked up because I have nowhere to park. I've been left messages on my windshield from municipality you know, uh, staff because I'm parking in their lots, which are in between the municipal building and the um, mm -hmm. senior building. So it's kind of not fair for them not to have spots for us who go there daily. Mm -hmm. um, I understand what, your concern. What can we do about that? Um, I think the mayor has something she'd like to say on that topic. Yeah, you, you emailed me today. I did, yes. And, um, and I did reach out to Mr. Kennard, um, the head of the housing authority, um, and I got his response at 5.30, so I didn't have a chance to get back okay. to you. Um, yes, there's 125 units. Uh, there are five, not two, five visitor parking spots. We would love to have more. Um, and one visitor spot specifically for disabled, which is right in the front of the building. Um, this is in addition to the, uh, the other two, the two spots that are on Broad Street. So all in, there are eight visitor parking spots. Now, that, am I saying that that's enough? No. But when this building was built, most of the people that were living there initially were very senior and were, were not driving. Now we currently have six or eight tenants who are on the waiting list for their own parking spaces. Many more people, are, residents, are parking there than used to when the building was built. Yeah. Um, do we recognize that we need to try to work on something and make something happen here? Yes. Um, and the, the developer has, been in, has had several conversations with the housing authority and the residents. See what we can do as we move forward in sub-district two. One. 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 Um, so, and there is parking. Um, 
but it's behind in but but it in behind right. the lot behind mm -hmm. but it's it's it is a it has to be on an hourly rate at this point so there's more than two there's eight um but it's still not we recognize it's not enough and we're working on it where are the eight besides the two on fraud i don't know that but i will make a note and i'll I'd find love, out yeah i'll I've find out tomorrow been going there for years and i'll find out tomorrow are. and let you know okay and i have your email okay um if you're speaking about when you're facing the building, there's a little section to the right, mm -hmm. right up against the building. You need um, a monthly permit from the housing to put on your windshield. If those are the spots that you're talking about for visitors. I'd love to tell you that I have that detailed information. I don't, okay. but I will speak with Mr. Kennard tomorrow okay, and just, get all the information about where those spots are and I'll get back to you. Okay, just please take into account that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Indeed. We have nowhere to park. And we've, we've already been there. thinking about that. It's yes. the discussion that we've been having okay, about yes. how to make it better for 12 Chestnut. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have another comment? Reverend Harriel? Uh, Dennis and Harriel, 140 Broad Street Summit. I like your presentation about the, your plan A for the enhancements of the traffic lights and all of that. I have a Morris and uh, Broad are county roads. So is there a plan B in case the county uh, rejects your recommendation, objects to it, is there something else? What's yeah. the contingency plan? So the city uh, and their consultant did have a call with the county. Uh, I was not on that call, so I guess I'd turn it over to Brian to let you know, but they have had discussions about some of these suggestions, so. Take that. Yeah, uh, so yeah, we had, a, we had a brief phone call with, uh, with the Union County engineer about a week ago to review uh, the scope of the improvements in the area, obviously. Morris Avenue, Broad Street, Summit Avenue, all, uh, all county roads under their jurisdiction. Um, the, the county um, expressed, uh, uh, I guess, a hesitancy to consider uh, uh, what they call curb extensions, the, the bump outs that shorten a crosswalk, uh, and anything vertical like a, like a raised table. Uh, we had considered a, a pedestrian table at one of the crosswalks. Uh, the county indicated they did not want those on their roadways, but all the other improvements, the signal improvements, uh, the realignment uh, at, uh, on Morris Avenue, um, the county indicated that they didn't have an issue with those. Thank you. Okay, um, any other comments from members of the public? Come on up, Ms. Kelly. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for your presentation. That was helpful. Um, I just have one comment and then a question. Just piggybacking off of what Councilman O'Sullivan said and what Councilman um, Lisa Allen said, we can't really, or I believe we shouldn't really look at this traffic study um, in a silo. And what I mean by that is there are 2,000 roughly units going up in development in the surrounding area. Morris Ave, you said, gets roughly 15,000 you know, visitors a day. Now, when you add 2,000 to the surrounding area, and that's being only one person living per unit, let's say 3,500 is that number, now you're talking about a 20% increase. So I'm wondering if there is a way for some work to be done with you know, our neighbors to really look at traffic flow and just be a little bit more thoughtful about the general ecosystem that we're surrounded by, and especially on Morris Ave, I think is, is one of the biggest areas. Um, my next question is around, or my first question, excuse me, is around, you mentioned large levels of pedestrians for being um, the impetus of why you'd need some signals. Can you define large? because? You cited, I think, 12 walkers and 10 new cyclists. Is that considered a large increase? I would say, I mean, I wouldn't say that's, you know, on its own a large number. I think it was more so that there'd be a lot, there'd be the potential for a lot more pedestrian and vehicular interactions along the walkway, specifically to the train in the morning. If people are not commuting by car, their next most likely commuting pattern would be by, be by foot. Um, so again, this was related to uh, the walk, the additional um, lead walk phase at the intersections uh, along Broad. And again, it was about uh, 17 in the morning, and that's just the peak hour and 12 uh, in the evening. That was the pedestrian levels. Okay, and sorry, just my last question is, we have a school age children study that says 26 children are going to be presumably living in this building those 26 children are gonna to go to school in the morning, right? So does that account for your AM numbers, both in cars and people? 
I don't know that study. It seems high that 140 units would have 26 school-aged children, but again, I, I wasn't the one that produced that study, so I can't, I can't speak to that. Um, but again, just, no, no, knowing what I've worked on other projects for multifamily, other multifamily developments, the school study prepared by Rutgers University Center of Real Estate, I don't think has that level of percentage of students uh, uh, school age kids in 140. It might be maybe the sub district at large. I, I'm, uh, I'm not sure. No, it's this district, but thank you very much. Hmm. School age children. Oh. All right, so again, I'm oh, sorry. Good evening. Don Nelson, 20 Plain Street. Uh, I like your study. Uh, unfortunately, it's, it's very geared toward residential. Did you do a study for the commercial part, delivery trucks? arriving at all different times, and can you elaborate a little bit on that, how that will have to add to the traffic flow? I know downtown, when there's deliveries going on with the corners, now we put the no parking signs on our corners, where are all these, uh, all? If there's two tractor trailers there delivering to the stores down at the bottom level, where are they gonna park? And I know like Overtown has the delivery aisles behind the stores, but they can't use them because they're too narrow. So if you could elaborate on that, that'd be great. Certainly, so the study itself uh, did include trip generation associated with the retail users. The reason why I focus more on the, re on the residential as part of this discussion was just it's a little more, um, it's a little more tangible in the sense that the numbers tend to be a little bit, um, a little bit, uh, the expectation and the projection tends to be much more accurate. Resident uh, retail, as I mentioned, when we, when we used a convenience store as one of the potential tenants, basically just to grow those retail numbers to numbers that I think are much higher um, than what you'd expect from a retail tenant um, in kind of a downtown environment. Again, just for, for you know, uh, you know, example, uh, you know, a, a convenience store would generate about, you know, 250 trips in an hour. Um, that's obviously much higher than you would get for most kind of standard downtown retail establishments. You know, during the during the busiest hours of the day. Um, but that's what we utilize within our study. I do believe that there is um, arrangements for loading areas that are accessible um, for both the residential move-in, move-out movements as well as the uh, retail tenants in the building. So um, we would not expect to have the tractor trailer on the street uh, servicing this, this building. Uh, yes, yes. So can you show those on a plan, the drawing? Because I don't see them. I think the, this is, unfortunately, I just have this deck of plans. I think the architectural plans that were showed or provided. I would think as part of the traffic study, that should be. I think that's something that you could provide us that we could put up on. Absolutely. I, I could provide. It. So the architectural plan dealt with the, where the loading and how the loading basically serves mm -hmm. the service aisles and also the elevator banks for the residential right. uh, uses. So uh, we definitely can provide that and add that to this. This yeah, I think it would be good for everybody to know because, yeah. and then just, and maybe I shouldn't say this, but parking on Morris Avenue, how can you accommodate spots on Morris Avenue? Is there, is there a plan to widen the street? Um, you had mentioned parking on Morris Avenue. Is it so, right next to the building? So the county indicated that based on the width of Morris Avenue, they would, again, I was not on the call, it was the representatives of the city, that they would basically have one through lane and then basically parking along it along the stretch of Morris Avenue along uh, our property. And then, so to follow up on that, would you agree with that, that that's, that's adequate for, tr for through traffic? I believe so. Um, I, I, you know, and, and I understand, you know, there is some friction associated with parking movements. People Nothing to do park. with parking. This is just purely about a traffic study. Well, I mean, the travel lane is open. Really what parking actually does is, you know, we're looking at in this urban area, we're trying to slow people down. Uh, and right now, uh, you know, when there's no parking there, a, a motorist has a, a wide open travel mm -hmm. lane that increases the speed. W when there's an obstacle right alongside them, like a row of parked cars, which is a free traffic calming measure, that helps to, that, that is a measure that helps to keep the speeds down. Yeah. It, thanks. Are there any other comments from the public? Come on up. So I'm just going to let you guys know, after we finish with these questions, I, there are a lot of people here for the, um, uh, for the monument 
um, issue and a lot of Elks and American Legion people waiting. So we're going to we're going to take you guys next. OK, we'll jump you ahead and then we'll go back to the rest regular agenda. So we'll just do we'll finish parking, though, just to keep things simple. Cool. I okay. have a simple call. Hi, Charlie Cusimano, 22 Bedford Road. OK, um, I just this question just popped into my head because of your question. So if there's going to be more trap uh, parking there, what about emergency vehicles? Because it gets jammed up there regularly. <laughs> And if there's emergency vehicles coming through, how are they going to get through if it's all jammed up? Is, did that come through at all? Did you, did you, if, you know, at 5 o'clock there's a fire or whatever, right? all that kind of stuff, ambulances. I mean, it seems like it's going to be much more of a choke point than it is now even. So that's all just about emergency vehicles. Again, understood. I think that's something that would be worked out, obviously, with the city's consultants and the county. Uh, obviously, both those parties need to be um, agreeable to adding parking. The developer has no control over parking regulations on, on municipal or county roadways. Okay. Ms. Hardy, would you like to come up? Vivian Hardy, One Oak No Road in Summit. Um, I have a number of concerns, but because of time, I'm not going to go into all of those. Okay. <laughs> Could you put up the diagram of um, of where you did this, you know, that, that, that one exactly. One of my main concerns is that um, this is a small area and it doesn't include the impact that it could have on the rest of the town. I don't know how many of the rest of you drive around town every day and notice how many people are going on residential streets to avoid the places where there is a lot of traffic. One particular area is going across Maple Street, um, getting over to Mountain Avenue through the Brayton School District. Um, that is happening all the time, and I perceive that this will get to be more if these buildings are densely um, residents of cars, <laughs> have lots of cars. And um, the, uh, that also is true for Blackburn Road, and uh, Prospect Street, that the traffic sometimes, uh, given different things that are going on in town, can just be horrendous. And the cars on Pine Grove Avenue drive very, very fast to get to Ashland Road and to get out to 78. So the more tr cars we have in a concentrated area of downtown, the more I think that will affect our residential areas and could even eventually affect our our property values so i i think that is something that um, we haven't taken into account here and that this traffic study should actually have included the area that um, would include by the hospital and then also over by the uh, nuns uh, and and that intersection of springfield avenue um, and we don't have that information. We don't have, can't judge how those intersections are going to be uh, impacted by this. Um, the other thing, uh, it, the other assumption I have a, have a lot of problem with is the number of parking spaces that you're going to have in the actual development. And it seems very small for 140 units. And if most of those units have at least two people in them. We're now getting up into two hundreds of people. And I, I think that um, most people drive their own car. And if it's a married couple, they're going in different directions. They're not going in the same car. And so um, if you're not going to have enough parking spaces for them, are you perhaps actually going to make it so that they have trouble renting those units? If the people can't park their cars someplace, isn't going to be a problem. Um, so we're driven by this $18 million number that we want to get to. But I wonder if we need to step back and perhaps look at another alternative and then compare the two alternatives. Um, I don't hear that any of that has ever been done. For instance, what if you put condominiums there? Now, I know one of the answers is that you want to have um, uh, reasonable housing, a number of units that are reasonable. 
I've lived in Summit 54 years, and I was on the original committee that raised, fund, raised funds for Glenwood Place. Later, we learned that the state would not, um, not count some of the units that we had built even before it was public housing. Because over by, the hospital, over by the high school and Dennis Place, there's a whole area of more affordable housing that doesn't get counted in some of its numbers. And I'm wondering if the council has ever thought of going back to the state and saying, hey, we've got more affordable housing than you're giving us credit for. Um, so I just think that's something to think about. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Hardy. I'm going to ask people to restrict their comments to um, to things about traffic, and rather than going sort of further afield on this, and go ahead. Okay, hi. Uh, real quick, uh, Beverly Brown, two two one Ken Place Boulevard. Uh, you mentioned, Mr. Seckler, uh, two percent increase. So, what does that translate into? Two percent of of what? Uh, we were referring to the volume of traffic along Mars. So again, it was um, about a thousand vehicles in the you know, morning rush hour. So two percent of that would okay. be. Okay. Okay. Um, and then I know you were bef uh, before the planning board when it came to the Primrose School, and um, you know we asked some questions uh, regarding traffic then, and I believe I asked this question then, and I'll ask it again now. Uh, does your traffic study account for ways and Google Maps, and the redirecting? I think there were some allusions to how this will spread out into not just Morris, not just Broad, but into the uh, tertiary streets. So I would state that for this project, again, we have a pretty wide, I'd say, network of roads. Um, whereas, in addition, we are not seeing significant impacts to delays based on this development. If we were coming up with, this is going to cause 20 more seconds delay on Morris Avenue and 40 more seconds delay on Summit, then I do agree. I think there could be some rerouting. But when you're talking about one new car every two minutes, you know, based on this residential aspect, that's not going to trigger a someone rerouting their, their travel pattern, or at least I assume Waze is not going to reroute them because twice a week someone may be in front of you, you know, at the red light. I, I don't think it registers a delay amount that would entice you to go to an alternative means of travel. Hmm. Okay. Um, and just last question. Uh, I know you are a popular traffic engineer, <laughs> um, and you weighed in on uh, Westfield's Westfield Crossing and a lot of other, you mentioned Rutherford, I think you, you testified uh, for Morristown. Have you ever done a traffic study where your study uh, said that the increased traffic due to a development would overburden the area? Yeah, and they require mitigation or fixes. The Morristown project, we the roundabout we're constructing is because it, the roadway network would not support the ability for these office people to get back to 287. We had to construct, a, I think, a $2 million roundabout. Uh, I've had projects construct traffic signals, widen roadways, things of that nature. Okay, anything similar to the, what we've got going on here on Broad Street? Um, you know, we've looked at, you know, traffic signals in, you know, downtown areas, but those were areas that the development was much larger than we're, what you're looking at here. We worked at projects in Fort Lee uh, that required upgrades to eight traffic, eight intersections because of the size of the development. Uh, this one, again, based on the analysis that your, um, you know, the, the town's own consulting engineer has, has agreed to, um, doesn't appear to trigger that level of, of fixing or mitigation from a traffic point of view. Again, we are looking at safety improvements, pedestrian improvements, things along that nature because of this project, though. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Sibio, I think you're... Oh, oh. Ms. Lusher, come on up. Jeez. You want to sit down? Yeah, thank you. Hi, my name is Irene Lusher, and I live in town. Um, I had some questions about the traffic study in particular and some of the th sides that you showed. I'd like to go back to the slide where you had a discussion about the 2% increase um, in the residential. I don't think we ever got an answer or I wasn't clear on what you thought the retail would have. Right. So, again, our traffic study itself, and again, I'm going to state that 
I don't believe there's any intention to have a convenience store in this building, but if you did have a convenience store in this building and the retail, we'd expect that would add an additional 130 trips in the morning, about 90 trips in the evening, uh, rush hour. So that sounds a lot more than the residential. There was only, uh, was it 26 residential cars? I mean, 100 seems like a lot more. Yeah. Uh, so it must be... If, that must be like additional eight percent. So there's a couple there's a couple of factors at play here. One, all re retail trips don't necessarily mean they are new trips. Uh, and we use the example of a convenience store. A convenience store has over half its traffic is passed by traffic, meaning that those thousand people driving by on Morris, those make up a lot of the customers for retail, as opposed to res residential. You're you know you build a new residential building. Every person coming in that building is a brand new car to the network. You build a retail development, some of the new people going to that retail may be going specific, you know, decide to come to Summit for that retail, and a large percentage are people that are already on the busy roadway network of Summit. Now, again, we analyze this using convenience store. If we analyze this just as retail, just said it's 10,000 square feet of general downtown retail that you have in Summit, you'd be looking at increases of traffic in kind of the 10 to 20 range per hour as opposed to 100 or so range. So the report that you know, your, or the, the city's analyst looked at to come up with and agreed our conclusions included these higher, higher numbers. I didn't want to throw out there the thought that we are going to build a convenience store, which is why I didn't put that percentage on here as well. But again, you'd be looking at about 20 trips if it was just general, I'm going to say, you know, undescript retail, you know, restaurant, things like that. Are they going to ask you to do the same traffic study with the same corners that you marked in purple when they put in the grocery store across the street? Uh, um, the parking garage? Or does that affect the numbers? Or will it not affect it, the numbers? So I'll tell you, I am a consultant for this sub, phase, sub district. I have no idea... I'm not hired to do any other work, so I can't speak one way or the other about it. Maybe we'll see a different time. You, you may. See, it depends on how it goes tonight, I guess. I see. So you do have a financial stake in this plan? No. If it's, well, I mean, your future work. Ms. Lesher, I just want to clarify. At this point, the post office is not going anyplace, and we're not talking about a large grocery store. If there's a grocery store in sub-district one, it'll be a smaller, um, a smaller one. Okay. So, so just to clarify that. Okay. So that has changed. That has to, yeah, okay. the post office at this point is not interested in moving to another location. Okay. So. Um, the other question, oh, what I wanted to say was you had said that there was easy parking across the street at 7-Eleven, and it was nice to hear that a traffic expert said that underground parking is not easy. Um, so. Can I, I would state that what I was alluding to is if you're a quick serve retail the ability to get in and out of a building of a use quickly is important. So I would imagine if I was working for 7-Eleven real estate, I'd prefer to have a nice surface parking lot in front and pull in, have my customers pull in and out. I'm not speaking to whether an underground parking lot is good, better, or different. But from a 7-Eleven okay. business model, I don't think that they would love you'd have to okay. go around the block and park in a garage. I don't drive down that block much because there's nothing there really um, on my way to <laughs> somewhere. Um, can you compare that intersection in terms of traffic to another summit intersection um, in terms of the volume so that I can get a clearer idea? Oh, do you go through any of the other intersections within the, the pink study that you had? I drive on Summit Avenue, Springfield Avenue, um, but not in that triangle. Really. All right. Let me get, let me get you a number then. Hold on. I drive through the intersection of I guess Broad and Springfield, or Morris and Springfield. Let me look. Do you go through Morris and Summit? Not really. Uh, Mar uh, Summit and Broad, Summit and Union Place. Any other pink intersection here that I could compare it to? <laughs> I don't drive in that part of town, really. <laughs> so, Ms. Lesher, just in the interest of, of um, economy sure. of time, there are a lot of people waiting. Like, is it the same as the intersection of Summit and Springfield Avenue? Is um, that how busy that intersection is? Can you answer that question? I, I believe this intersection has 
less traffic on the side streets, so broad and focused are a little light, more less traveled than Summit, but we didn't study that as part of this project. I'd have to look at the two. Okay, thank you. Good evening. Hi, Council Mayor. Uh, nice to see you guys. Amy DeCivio, 106 Road. Um, I just have a question for the cars for the, uh, for the apartment. How many cars, actually cars, were you using for that building, for the 140 units? What was the car number? You meaning in terms of parking or in terms of how many, trips? When you, were, when you were estimating, you know, 50% of the people would leave or 20% of the people would leave at the same time, what was the total car number you were looking at for 140 units? So, and I know this won't be exact the answer that, that you were asked, that, that you were looking for. The calculation we use for determining trip generation for a multifamily building is the number of units. So we basically just take the number of units and then we have a formula that says, you know, take the number of units, multiply it by, and again, it's approximately half. And that tells you the number of trips that would be generated. So it's not necessarily related to the number of cars that people may have in the building, but it's specifically related to the number of units that are in the building. Okay, so the number of trips is generated by the number of units, not the number of cars. With, with a limiting factor. Obviously, if we were doing a project in Jersey City, we can't just take that, and let's say there's no parking provided on site. Right. Then obviously it would be unreasonable to say that, you know, if we were doing 100 units, that 50 cars would be generated in the peak hour because it, clearly there's no parking for that. So when we do these studies, we also then look at the parking supply to just basically to say, is this within range? You know, and that's when we look at census data for Summit, people that live near the train station and, you know, Summit, how many cars do they own? How do they commute? And we come up with uh, a calculation. Okay, a so there's no way to know how many cars you think would be well, the, the, the number of trips, that number? No, like, so the number of trips that I'm stating, that's the number of cars that will be going in and out of the driveway. Right. The number of cars that will be in the building would be more related, I guess, to parking. But not everyone leaves during, the, you know, the rush hour. Mm -hmm. People that may have a car and they may take the train, they may never move their car during rush hour. Okay. Um, did your study take into the fact that there are 140 units and I think it's 89 parking spaces that many of the residents won't have a parking space in the building as it stands and so they may be circling to try to find a spot on the street? I believe there's um, at least 128 spaces in the building, if not more. I think there's been some late revisions to the Plan well, I think there's 89 dedicated spots to the building, and then there's a, an ancillary it's, it's, lot that I thought was supposed to be used for the retail space. Or how does that work? There's uh, that that number is still, you know, in flux. In flux. We it, the number is going up, so we're getting more parking spaces. But no, the the will that affect the numbers? No, the, again, we utilize a calculation. We then take that calculation. We say, does this make sense based on the parking we have? The parking that we have for this building will be slightly greater than, I guess, some numbers have been tossed around earlier because we're trying to take that garage and kind of make it more efficient in terms of where the spaces are located. You know, mm -hmm. just, just angle spaces differently. Okay. You know, there's some dead spaces in a building that is that shape trying to make the more spaces fit inside. Okay, and then one other question, because I know it's getting late. On the, the second lot, the one that's the munis considered the municipal lot, can you just show that on your screen again real quick? It's the one that's supposed to be, I think it's 39 spaces or something like that. It's the second. I think you, I think you pointed out the entrance was, yeah, can you just show me? So the, that entrance is the one that's that little bump in off of Morris Avenue between the green space and the big yeah. building? Yes. Okay, so that's going to be, quote, municipal space. So who's supposed to use that space? Because if you're, like, in town or wherever, that's a pretty big hoof from town. So is, are those units supposed to be, those parking spaces supposed to be dedicated for the retail space that's there? Do you understand what I'm saying? That's the municipal lot. That's not for the residences. This is a parking question, really, more than a well, traffic question. Well, but um, it sort of goes to that. So how are people going to be coming into that, in and out of that space? You're referring to... No, it, it really is more of a parking question. Okay. So we can talk about that another time, in fairness. I'm just trying to understand who's going to yeah. use that space, being that it's on the far... It's a really big distance from downtown. So, okay, thank you. That's all. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry, can I ask... I'm, I'm confused. 
We're talking about that gray space where you said the people, are you talking about the, the entrance and egress from Morris Avenue? This entrance right, right here on Morris, 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 I think. Yeah, thank you. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this entrance here, is this the, is this the municipal? No. 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 It's the entrance no. to the parking garage. Yeah. the main parking garage. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're, where's the municipal entrance? No. Okay, so I'm, I'm calling it the municipal lot that's under here, the retail lot. Is that the retail lot entrance? Sorry, I'm asking the wrong question. Wait, which, which entrance is this? The residential, residential parking. That's the park. Oh, yeah, that, that's the residential park, yes. Where is the retail lot? Off of Cedar Street. Right, yeah, right, 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 right there. Right there. Right there. Right there. Okay, right there. thank you. So I just checked, it's 110 uh, units of uh, 110 spaces of parking for residents, 30 uh, for retail. Which can be shared, shared at yes. night. Right, but that's the latest numbers. And then there will be some on-street parking as well. So, Okay, come on up. Hi, Sue Roberts, 48 Oakland Place. So I have a parking leading into a traffic question, so bear with me until I get through it all. So right now we all know there's not enough parking spots for the units in the building and that's just assuming that everybody has one car and not two car families so if we think forward a little bit to Lisa's point another phase of this is the parking garage that we're going to build so I think it'd probably be safe to assume that some of those parking garage spots will be overflow from the additional 140 units does the council plan after phase one is done to do another traffic study to see if we're close to these numbers before you go forward with any other plans to build more parking garages. Yes, yeah, I, I think, I think they, as far as the other phases go, we we'll, there'll be another one. traffic yeah. analysis yeah. of that. A full traffic analysis they'll, they'll, like you know, for sub district it is. one. Yeah. Like we'd, before we build another garage, Correct. we'd do it. Correct. Okay. Then, based on the financial. Um, plans that were presented at the last meeting. My understanding, and I don't have all the numbers in front of me, is that we're, we're depending on a 95% occupancy rate in order to get back the monies that we've received. So I'm right in understanding that if not having a parking space is an issue for renting that space, then that whole financial model has to be readjusted. Um, it's 90, the 95% calculation is the calculation that they assumed for the stream of revenue for a pilot. But understand that these that the developers are not going to be building this unit without enough parking. They you know they know the market. They know in this market how many you know in a building like this how many cars they need to accommodate. And that you know they do this all over the country. They do it all over this region. They you know it's. I, I, you know, they're not building something that's underparked because if they build something that's underparked, it doesn't get rented and then they lose money too. So I think. So is it a 95% occupancy rate or it's not? Do we know what they're assuming for the occupancy the, rate? That, the pilot numbers that Dr. Powell used last time were based on 95% okay. occupancy rate. So you're telling me that the, the developer's 95% rate takes into account that there's going to be parking for all of those residents? takes into account what they think the adequate parking is and what the parking numbers that we've worked out and that we will eventually get to will be. They, you know, they, they know what their market is, is my point. And when, when we, we can I say, when we started this process, because we're not real estate experts up here, um, we started by talking five years ago to multiple, multiple developers and, and saying, before we even put out an RFQ, um, a re request for proposal or, um, Qualifications. Qualifications. What, what do you think um, is market, marketable in this space? What, what would make sense? Because that's, we needed that information. And we got a lot of information from very high-level developers from throughout the region. Then we put together the request for qualifications um, based upon what these six, seven, eight developers thought were doable, what would be see feasible in this area. And then we got multiple responses from very high-level developers, and after that, then we 
chose a developer through many, many conversations and, and negotiations and have come through this. They're going to spend $70 million to build uh, this project, uh, this one building. They're not going to do that if they think that they're not doing it where they can rent the apartments and, and make a reasonable return on their investment. Um, and, and so that's what we're going with. And I think that's what we believe is accurate based upon their track record. Two companies that have a long, experienced, and successful track record in New Jersey and throughout the nation. Right. And so even if they think they can rent it, we still have a space and traffic issue for parking, right? I mean, does anyone here think we don't have a parking issue as a result of the 140 more units? That's why we, we were saying that the numbers, we're talking with Mrs. DeCivio, the numbers are changing. We're work, we recognize that we need to fully address the parking issue. They're not building a, apartments anymore with, in, in a suburban, urban area where people are needing two cars. The 125 Summit Avenue Beacon, it's one parking space per unit. Uh, we're, we're estimating 1.4. That's right. what my, my point is, we're not finished. Okay, so then I would like to respectfully request that until we have that parking adjustment nailed down, I don't think we should be entering into any final agreement because we don't have all the pieces figured out yet. We've Ms. stated Roberts, that multiple times, we said that, that we're not going to be signing or, or approving a redevelopment agreement until the parking issue is decided. Okay, and you expect that to be still before the April meeting? If we don't have, it, it's not, we are not signing anything till the issues are, are decided. It's not gonna be a surprise when we're ready to, to sign the agreement, there are gonna, there's gonna be another opportunity for people to, have, to make comments, ask questions, it will, you know, this is not going to take you by surprise. When, as soon as we have the parking sorted out, we will be back to the public with a report on the parking, okay? okay. Thank and you. I think Ms. And Little, uh, Council Member Little had something she wanted to say. I just wanted to point out that at one of the meetings I asked directly if the developers have been um, given the number of spaces, if they felt that it was adequate for the number of units, and I was assured that they do. We went to see, they knew that this is their business. Buildings, they rent them. They rent them for high rent. They know how many spaces they need in order to rent these apartments at market rate. And I would assure that they uh, look at the parking that is in the building and they feel it's more than adequate to cover um, the uh, the unit, uh, the rent at market rate, and the retail space to rent at market rate. So they are comfortable. They have no incentive to underpark this building. As you said, they have every incentive to make sure that there's adequate parking for both residents and the retail. And they are comfortable with it. And they have. Uh, a, a tremendous amount of expertise in this area, and they have every incentive to make sure that the building is properly parked. So I think that can give all of us a little bit of assurance about the parking situation. I also okay. want to mention that on top of that, we have our own professionals who validated those numbers. So we're not just going on the say-so of the developers. So you know we have our own independent experts who've been validating this information as well. Okay, and then I'd have one more request. Now that we've figured out that the 24 additional students, and I'm still foggy as to where that number comes from. I know it's a Rutgers study, but I don't no, know. It's not a Rutgers study. There is a um, there's a report on the city's website. You can read the, the report. Okay. So can we readjust this now that we're talking about 24 students because? That sounds like that's new news. So again, the trip generation that we calculate is based on studying sites in operation and counting the cars that enter and exit those type of sites. So I assume that other operating developments have some portion of residents that have children that require them to be driven to school or walk to school. So again, our study, we don't, we don't pull out, okay, these are the people that are going to work. There's 12 people going to work. There's 16 people going to a school and basically add them all up. We, based on counts that are done at existing sites and their driveways, that's how we come up with how much traffic this site would generate. So again, just as much as you know, uh, you know, other sites may have school children. This one, we've accounted for that analysis as well. I was just again, I hadn't seen the school children study, so it just seemed like it was a higher number unrelated to the traffic aspect. Okay, and that analysis, you're comparing to towns that don't have busing, just like Summit. Is that correct? I'm um, comparing a whole, you know, basically a generic residential building that may have busing, may not have busing, 
may have you know a great school district may have an average school district. So it's basically a, a compilation, an average of, of all of those. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Dory Gagnon, Twenty Seven Bedford Road. Um, so traffic has been my thing uh, with all of the uh, planning board meetings. So. This is my topic here, so you have to give me a couple minutes. I know the Elks are waiting. Um, so I live in a half mile radius of the high school and live right across from Oratory. And so I can attest to the fact that I appreciate what you guys do, so I'm not discounting your expertise here. However, there's been two failed uh, engineers for the high school and the planning of that parking lot. So that expansion of that high school and failed planning there on that parking for the juniors and seniors, and I mentioned that before at prior council meetings. Um, there was no parking taking into account for the expansion of that high school. So I just want to remind everybody that we have to plan for the future. And um, like Ms. Allen said, we have to take into account to everything that's going on around us and the 3,000 uh, apartment units and all of the expansion that's going on around us is going to impact us here. So uh, like oratory, I was against the building across the street because I did not buy my house across the street from a school. And now that there is a school and the parking and the traffic um, engineer uh, told us that there was going to be no impact on our street. But there is. There's two cars that are constantly parked outside my house. Um, and it impacts us almost daily and nightly. So I think we have to look at the future and how this is going to impact our entire town. Um, so I have these two things that I'm constantly dealing with on a daily basis. So um, I think we have to really look into the future and I know we're not looking at the next sub-districts um, and we're gonna, you know, like you said, we're going to reevaluate it after this one, but we really have to stop and think what's going to happen when everything starts overflowing onto Morris. And I know, like you said, we have to stop and slow down traffic. I can't even drive up Morris Avenue. So like another um, resident said, we go and we route ourselves. So I don't drive up Morris, but I take Beechwood, I take Woodland, I go all around all the other town, all the other streets throughout town. So I think we have to um, just take a step back and look how this is going to impact everything else and um, and the retail. So great we're not having a grocery store. Ms. Gagnon, can mm -hmm. I ask you to just get to your question? There are a lot of folks um, Okay, so uh, I, I'm waiting. sorry. I have been waiting, so everyone no, else got to talk. So I just, my point is the retail that's going in down below, we're not having a grocery store, but what if we have like a little bodega or a bakery or we have a bagel place that draws in morning traffic and a deli, like today was a half day. So there were mobs of kids in town at uh, noon today. I mean, mobs. My daughter works at Square Pizza. It's great. So she was there helping out at 1230. I mean, I, that kind of traffic that could be, which I would, I would love to have more downtown, more people coming. But those kids coming from the middle school and that kind of traffic coming at that intersection scares me. I already had one son who was in a horrific bike accident here in town. And, and um, Beverly behind me was probably on the call. So she got to witness it. It is a horrific, it, it's horrific to see your own child get carried off in an ambulance. And I don't wish that on anybody else here. So I really want everybody to understand what it's like to um, just slow down and have people understand that the traffic needs to just come to an end here and I don't want more of it. Um, uh, the other thing I, um, I, I wanna understand is the impact on the YMCA on the Cedar Street being closed. So if that is closed, how is that gonna Im impact the YMCA drop-offs? Um, if you have anything that you can say on that. Ms. Gagnon, it's not gonna be closed. It's Cedar Street is going to be open. It, can, it has the potential to be closed if the YMCA has an event where they want. The oh, party. I thought it was just going to be closed. Like the whole street was going to be closed and just that little no. opening to no, go no. in and out. No. Nope. They're not calling it. it. Well, they're calling it Cedar Plaza, but it's a shared street and it is not closed. So, so um, is it is it like not a street anymore? Is it like it's pavers? Still it's, it's still a street. It's still a street. There was discussions again if it would be flexible so if there needs to be or wants to be outdoor space from the YMCA they would be accessible kind of I guess what you have you know in downtown you know on in the summer but it's going to be an open street it's a public street We're not okay so you can go both ways still correct for, yes. okay yep. okay so still drop off for the back of the YMCA to be able to use that was okay. exactly what the redevelopers had spoken to the Y about because they wanted that drop okay. off to be available okay thank you for clarifying 
there, are there any other comments? Okay. Deborah Oliver, uh, just a quick question that relates to parking, which relates to traffic, which relates to the overall design of the building. Uh, we keep being siloed off in these meetings, and I thank you for your time. These were wonderful traffic reports. But I'm wondering when the residents of Summit are actually going to have a fulsome discussion about all of these things, because they're all one big ball of wax. They can't really be siloed off as, as you're trying to do. So when are we planning on having the next town hall meeting? Not emails that kind of disappear down a black hole, but a back and forth where there's truly a discussion, not a one-way street, about all of the concerns that have been raised about the Subdistrict 3 project in particular. In particular because we've, a month has gone by, and we're, we're not being allowed to talk about all these different aspects. So that's my question. The answer is that we are presenting things to you as we have them available to us in the interest of bringing people in and giving people updates as we as we receive them we you know and if we waited till everything was tied up in a neat little ball to have a conversation then everyone would be upset that we hadn't brought them in sooner so this is you know, part, it's an iterative process, as we've said, and I'm not going to argue with you. No, about no, it's it. not an argument, but okay. iterative process, I know. Um, in my former career, I practiced as an architecture for a as an architect, a professional architect for a decade. I have an undergraduate degree in architecture from Princeton, a master's degree in architecture and urban planning, <clears throat> also from Princeton. I know exactly how the iterative design process works, and it is something where Criticism needs to be received from the clients, that's us, and delivered to the design team. And then they come back, they come back with changes to the design all at once so that then you can see the next presentation. And we're not being allowed, we're getting little snippets like, I'm glad to read on your FAQ that some parking has been increased. Where's the design? How has that impacted the building? And why are we still talking about 140 units when that is 25 units over the maximum density that's allowed by the redevelopment plan. So it's, it's, um, I'm wondering when we can actually have a two-way two discussion. That's really what I'm asking. Look, I, think, I, I don't think it's fair to say that there haven't been two-way discussions. We well, have engaged the public since 2016 with the master plan, and then 2018 we started the redevelopment process. And a lot of what you're seeing today is what people you know, in 2018, came to meetings, picked, you know, looked at images and said what they wanted to see. And we can't, you know, we went back and forth with the redevelopers, came back with different things. It, this is not, you know, there's, uh, granted, there are some people who were not aware that this was going on, but this has been over four years of back and forth. So I don't think it's fair to say that that hasn't happened. Well, I, I appreciate that. And, and I totally acknowledge that this is, that there's, the website is just papered with legal documents. I, I get that. I've read through all of them, and I bet a lot of people haven't. But really, you can't talk about a building until you have a drawing. And the first time we were given a drawing was at the town hall meeting that was a little over a month ago. We saw some perspectives and renderings in the Zoom virtual meeting in, in 2021. But really, the conversation can't start until we get away from words and we get into drawings. And that's where people are and that's what people saw. And people had wonderful comments and they're still trying to ask these questions and they're still trying to see what the changes are. And I think that's where it's not getting pulled together. So a I think we all are hoping that you'll have a couple more town meetings. Show us the new parking. Show us how that works and, um, and let us talk about the size of the building, and why is it still 140 units? Well, the size of the building is something that is, is not something that we're going to continue to talk about as far as we're not going to be redesigning this building. We have we got to this point after four years of back and forth and, and input from the community, and I know that's not what you want to hear, but that's... I don't have a preset. I don't have, I don't have any preset concept, but I did read your own not you personally, but council's own carefully crafted redevelopment plan of 2019, and it sets forth standards for density. And this Subdistrict 3 building doesn't abide by those standards. So that's a mismatch that uh, we all wonder about, because 
we love the redevelopment plans. It's, it's a vision for Summit, but, but we're not following it with this, this building. Unless I'm mistaken, the, the redevelopment plan is a framework, and within that framework, um, there are opportunities for us and for the developer to um, get some certain amenities that the city wants, for sure. which then the redeveloper gets um, increased in density. Um, and so I, I believe, please correct me if I'm wrong, Michael, but I believe that the 140 fits within the framework of the redevelopment plan. There was a certain number that was set forth, but we're not going, I don't think we're going beyond the plan, well, given, given the opportunity for the amenity and enhancements. And I'm we're getting far afield from traffic, so I apologize. Okay, well, I would, I'm sorry, but I would disagree with you there because well, actually, maybe I could be wrong. I'm not, I'm not you know, <laughs> um, with, if you add in, I'm not an architect. Okay. Well, if you add in the 45 units per acre, uh, you know, we're, and, we're and way, way, we haven't even started the agenda yet. And the other, yeah, I know, I know. So, no, so Michael, can, can you, can you Michael, can you please you like have another town hall meeting where we, we can actually vet yeah, we these plan ideas? We to have that, and <coughs> we're not going to vote on anything without having a full presentation and another discussion. Well, are you referring to another council meeting where we're restricted in what we can say, or are you talking about a town hall? I don't know what the difference is. Oh, there's a huge difference. You're restricted in what you can say at a council meeting. Yeah, you're way? telling us we can only talk about traffic. <laughs> no, <laughs> but example. if we Because we have traffic consultants sitting here answering questions. That was the agenda, but if we have an overall open meeting regarding the the project. the project. We will have all of our professionals here to answer whatever questions are being fielded. And I, we don't know yet whether it's going to be here or whatever. We'll figure out a, a location, but that's not really. But the it will occur. The important thing is having all of our traffic, you know, all of our people. Tonight we only have our traffic experts, so we're all I understand, talking. and I apologize yeah. for the digression, but I think everybody would really like to have a fruitful, wholesome two-way street discussion. And we'll do that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Very quickly. On your mind, 10 Milton Avenue. Um, Monica, the lady that spoke about the senior housing across mm -hmm. the, the street, my mother-in-law lives there. And I'm so glad that she spoke because I've had the same problem. And one thing leads to another. So I don't know who did a traffic study. You said it was years ago when people didn't, older people didn't have cars. Uh, the parking it, 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 study it, for the senior house. For the senior It was house. when the building was built Historic. many years ago. Right. So somebody did a parking study. I, I presume so. I right. don't so know. They got it before my time. I don't know that there was a parking study. All I know is the assumptions right. they made when the building was built was that they didn't need a X number of parking because not many people well, were driving. Well, here we are today in 2022, right. and there's something wrong. The high school, Dory spoke about it. There's not enough parking. My son is here. He's 18. He's no parking for the fourth quarter. He does cross country. We live at the east side of Broad Street. It's 40 minutes walk to school. The high school got it wrong. Parking's not adequate. And here we are today. But he's going to be here. He's 18, he votes. We all, most of us have AARP membership here. He doesn't. So he'll be here to witness what this goes forward as, what it will look back, when he looks back in 20 years time this mess might be. That's my prediction. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, are there any other comments? So we have one, uh, would you like to read the one written comment? Uh, Council President, there was a, um, an email received uh, yesterday from uh, Dr. Jeff Hankinson. Uh, he asks uh, the, to ask the presenter, Brian Stankus, uh, regarding the Broad Street West traffic study, where the bike lanes will be. It is imperative that we provide lanes for the emerging uh, battery-powered bicycles, scooters, and other devices, which will become more popular as a way to get uh, to the train station. A bicycle corral is eventually be constructed, and a safe route should be designed in the traffic plan. Well, at this point, uh, I can say that the, the plans do not include any marked bicycle lanes. Uh, they were... I guess we had re we had spoken of that. Obviously, the bicycle circulation improvements are an, an important part of the redevelopment plan. Um, I would say, with regard to Subdistrict Three, um, you know, that Laura, Broad Street and Morris are both under the jurisdiction of of the county. Um, but really, I think the I, I think the discussions that we ended up having with the with the redevelopment team on the city side was that. Um, the the I, I think it has to do with the 
with the framework and the guidance or the, the I guess the lack of specific guidance in the in the redevelopment plan as to what bike line what bike lanes need to be uh, included and I think also the other factor is uh, the lack of a larger bicycle planning study for example a bike lane on uh, Cedar Street uh, isn't much use if it doesn't connect to to a larger network um, I, I, it's obviously something that needs to be looked at going forward uh, maybe with other you know as other subdistricts come on as as the opportunity to expand a bike network uh, presents itself um, but at this point obviously the you know the streets are very constrained um, as well you know it, it, it's not easy um, but that's the, that's the state uh, of, of the the, the bike circulation at this time and I don't Matt I don't know if you have anything else to add I have nothing to add it, it's obviously related to the city and, and their consultants okay thank you for the answer and um, with that I'm we're going to end the presentation and move on to the next item uh, Mr. Sankis and Mr. Seckler thank you so much um, for an excellent presentation thank you it was a little bit of an endurance contest, but I think you guys are off. <laughs>